<laughs> so Lisa Toronto, right? Founder of Tricycle Gardens. Uh, I've known you for over 20 years, probably close to, maybe close to like 15, maybe. I don't know. It's been since I started this garden stuff. Um, yeah. Lisa is an inspiration uh, and was an inspiration to me. I remember when we did that event, Revitalize RVA, and we had the flyer, and it was like the skyline of Richmond, and it was like all of this smoke and like particular matter in the air. <laughs> we did it uh, during the National week Weekend. So good. That was, and it was such a great event. We had Lisa, uh, uh, a holistic health consultant, uh, Alice Freeman. Uh, we had Dennis Harvey, who's a master gardener. Uh, we had uh, Renard Turner, a uh, black farmer, and uh, Salim Ahmed, who's a black farmer, too. And we talked about uh, the food system and agriculture and eco ecological justice. And it was one of them, it was, for me, it was the first kind of like, oh, this is, this is, yeah, this is a deep well to be digging into. And um, yeah, it was, that was, that was, that was, uh, damn, that had to have been like 2007. Yeah, that was like 2007. That was, yeah, it was a long time. <laughs> That's like 13 years ago. Um, from there, I was working at social services and I was also working with the Mayor's Youth Academy. And um, mm -hmm. I remember trying to plug Lisa up to run the Urban Ag part of the uh, Mayor's Youth Academy <laughs> and, and things. So man, yeah, we have some long, we have a long intertwined story and I'm um, super excited uh, to have you on a call today. Um, I was hoping that we can just kind of like be chill and off the cuff and just kind of uh, have a conversation. Uh, I wanted the folks that are on the call, these are people from our Ginner Urban Gardener training program. Um, and, um, you know, we are our previously scheduled series of presentations have been interrupted. So we're uh evolving uh our, our, our weekly calls so that we can introduce folks to different people in the system or different people in the community who've been doing work around um the ecology right and um, i thought it would be really healthy to uh have them meet you since you've played such a pivotal role in richmond virginia's uh, urban agriculture movement and um, yeah like help uh, them understand like what inspired you to get into that work what brought you to the state of uh, starting tricycle um, how your narrative in that space evolved and you know kind of like what you're doing now and what was driving you around this work so um, you don't have to all say all that at once. <laughs> so I'm going to start <laughs> off <laughs> just by, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, you know, uh, how did you get into this work? What, what inspired you to get into working with green things and trying to uh, make a difference with them? Well, it started when I was in college, which was in um, the 80s, the, um, I went to school, architecture school. But <clears throat> before that, my dad's a climate scientist. So, um, you know, we didn't always had a lot of information and knowledge about nature and the climate. And it was uh, just normal in my family. It was, kind of doomy for a lot of people but, um it was it is it is what it is and i went to architecture school and in the 80s architecture was in a really kind of boring place it was after modernism and then there was postmodernism, and there was nothing really very interesting happening in the world of architecture in the 80s except in my opinion arcasanti which was out in the desert in arizona started by an italian architect 
named Paolo Soleri, and he, he was a total visionary, and his idea was, uh, he called it arcology, which is architecture and ecology. And uh, the story was about how we can design cities that go vertically instead of horizontally. And it was really one of the first big responses to sprawl, to what suburban sprawl was doing to destroy the environment, to destroy communities, to um, create um, a system that was really not as beneficial as we have been told that the American dream presents to us. So I, I left after my third year and I went in, I lived out there for about a year and a half. And I went back, I ended up going back to, to school and I, I got my degree and I, but I couldn't imagine sitting in an office and sitting behind a desk. So I did some, I was an artist and had a studio and kind of made a living, but you know how that goes. So I ended up finally getting a job in an office. And after about two years, I dropped into such a level of malaise, of physical, emotional, spiritual, psychological, mental, and I ended up calling the phone number in the back of the city bus press. MCV was looking for people to um, be part of some new study, and I failed the depression test. So um, it was situational, not chemical. And I, and I knew, and that was 2002, 2003, and I knew that, I knew about community gardens. So I decided to, you know, I, we, a group of us came together and we started the first community garden uh, in Churchill on Jefferson Avenue. And it just really grew from there. And for me, it was a, a passion about how we design cities that are, ecological that have some kind of ecological system built into their design and you know the root of ecology which is eco which means home um it's really the fundamental language of how we design our world but we seem to have forgotten that in so many ways and so that was 2003 and we started this program and it was it was hard it was when i think about it now it was 10 years that i did it and we built about nine projects including a big urban farm the bainbridge farm and changed policy in the city land use policy and that that was i mean that was a circus and um you know, when I think about it, I would say that, you know, I went into it very idealistically and I was very naive. And um, I experienced, it was such an education for me on so many levels. But I would say that about 80% of my energy went into a black hole for about 20% results. And that's not a, a ratio I find to be particularly appealing. And I never want to ever, I will never be in a situation where that much of my energy is met by resistance or by um, bureaucracy or by ignorance. Um, so it didn't end well for me uh, at all. I was removed by the board of directors i made some strategic mistakes i got some corporate people on the board um and uh, things got sticky there's you know organizational dynamics can get very weird uh and i was kicked out and i after 10 years of work i lost community i lost friends i lost self-esteem I lost um, respect for myself. I lo also lost about sixty thousand um, dollars, and it was it was extraordinarily traumatic. And so um, after that all happened, I made a um, commitment to myself and to the world that it didn't matter what I did. It didn't matter what my job was. It didn't matter how much money I made. 
that my work had to be, my vocation, my work was about healing the relationship between humans and the planet. And it didn't matter how that manifested itself, as long as that was the core of the work that I um, did and do. And um, so now I have the great fortune of living and working at a Tibetan Buddhist retreat center, who, um, which is headed by Robert Thurman and Nana Thurman. And um, about 90% of my energy gets results. And about 10% goes into the black hole of just gen systems and life. And it's pretty cool. And Robert Thurman, I, I don't know if you guys know who he is. Um, does it? Does anyone here? We got one thumbs up. No, who is that? Who is Robert Thurman? So Robert Thurman was the first American to be, or the first uh, USA person. United States of America. And I have Bolivian and South American family, so I'm trying not to say American because we're not. There's a lot of Americans, it's not just the United States. The first United States of American mm. to become a fully ordained Tibetan Buddhist monk. And he was oh, wow. very close and still is with the Dalai Lama. Wow. He also ran in a, the crowd with Timothy Leary and... Um, um, Ram Das and Baba Das and Ram Das was the Be Here Now guy mm -hmm. and was part of the very early story of the American psychedelic scene. Mm -hmm. And so it's so interesting to have gone from Richmond, Virginia, where you can't say the word marijuana out loud to <laughs> a place where um, I think it's changed, but when I was there, you couldn't, you could not talk about marijuana in mixed company. You had right, to be right. very safe. Mm -hmm. So now I live and work somewhere that's a, a part of the lineage of the American psychedelic scene where um, there's an understanding that we are all connected, that mycelium plays a very important role in all of our health, mm. that... Um, uh, you know, I went with, with Bob, he goes by, by Bob, uh, and did the Al Gore climate reality training last summer. And um, we have 320 acres in this beautiful, very secluded valley. And um, we are working on a lot of stuff around ecological, spiritual ecology, I'll mm -hmm. say. And it's, it's pretty cool because here I'm seen as kind of square, you know, I'm a little bit normal. <laughs> and so, and, and it also, it's, and it's also, it's the, he and his wife are Uma Thurman's parents. So there's a little oh, wow. bit of, um, of, I call it, I call it bougie woo woo. <laughs> so there's a little bit of, um, you know, a little bit of a scene but it's, you know, it's kind of interesting to be around people who are, have a subtle kind of power mm. um, and um, a depth of conviction that is real and it's not based on the stuff that I experienced in Richmond. And I try, you know, it's been seven, seven or eight years and I try, you know, I, I, I have some resentment, but I, I work really hard to to keep it at bay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lisa, can I ask a question? Are you, sure. Are, are you up in the Catskills? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm from Albany, and um, I've, I've been out to Daibosatsu, which is, I think, the Zen. Where, where is that? I believe it's like, you're in Phoenicia? Yeah. Yeah, so Daibosatsu is by, like, um, if you keep going on Route 28 to, like, uh, Balsam Lake, uh, it's, it's around, kind of around the bend from, from you guys. It's hard to get to. Uh, wait, is, it's not the guy that started the, um, Rudy's Bread, is it? Hmm. That was a, maybe not. It's Peter Matheson was one of the founders. Okay. 
there's a lot and I gotta let my cat yeah. out because she's being really demanding right now. There's a lot. Um, <laughs> it's pretty wild because you know we're close to Woodstock and even though the Woodstock festival didn't happen in Woodstock, there was a lot of that, um, you know, the, the story of the American, um, the, the first dropouts and this culture is, it's pretty, it's wild. I really like it. I'm very comfortable here. <laughs> yeah. So, so let's, so let's talk, let's talk about, uh, first, let's talk about urban agriculture, right? Um, you know, you said the story starts with you all, well, in Richmond, the story starts with starting the first community garden, uh, or one of the first community gardens, or the first community garden in, uh, at Jefferson, uh, at 25th and Jefferson. Um, you know, that, 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 that work had to have been, uh, oh man, it had to have been, pretty groundbreaking first of all uh but second of all i want to find out like what inspired you to even want to undertake you know the community like that as a project like you and whomever you were working with like what what put that what put that spark into into you guys to want to even start that you know what i mean like what 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 brought what what brought drew you to the conclusion that a community garden was where it was at um because um we wanted to make a better world and a better neighborhood mm, 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 mm. Was it, and, what, and, and what we kind? saw that <clears throat> community gardens you know they not only bring people together um uh, to build community, but they beautify. Um, you can look at it from the financial standpoint that property values go up. Um, mm. But for me, that's not that interesting. It's really that you're you're building a more complex ecological system. Mm. So for me, that's the really interesting part because we know that we have a crisis of biodiversity loss, right? And so I think last year was estimated that in, we lost 30 million songbirds. Mm. And, and songbirds are dependent on mostly caterpillars and um, some other insects. And if, they, if we don't have the trees and the flowers and the, and the plants and the dried leaves from the fall left over, we're not gonna have the caterpillars. And if we don't have the caterpillars, we're not gonna have the birds. And if we don't have the birds, we're not gonna have the raptors that eat the songbirds. And if we don't have the raptors, you, you know, so we have the, the, the chain of events that, that goes up. And, and in an urban area, we tend to really have a, a dearth of biodiversity. And it's, you know, many studies have shown that it doesn't take that much acreage or space to build um, a, a garden that is diverse, that can then turn around and support biodiversity. You know, so I think that that's, that's part of it and it's the the biodiversity then in turn supports human systems and so the level of um the various levels of collapse that we're looking at right now from my understanding is based on the fact that we have um we have fragmented fragmented our ecological systems um, and so by the simple act of building a garden, which is turned out it's not really that simple, um, <laughs> and getting people to, to come, but I think, you know, it's probably a lot simpler now because, because it is a part of, um, uh, an urban pattern and an urban language. Um, and well, the awareness around the various levels of environmental crisis or I would think, I don't know. I live in a bubble up here where we're all like, you know, we we're, we're all on the same page. I don't know in Richmond, but what was really 
interesting to me was that it, a lot of it did start to become about race. And that was something I d d was naive about. And I had not anticipated that that was going to become part of the discussion. But anyway, so the reason that I, that I did start it is because, you know, there was a vacant lot and, and um, like, why not? Why not do it? And so we did. And, you know, and I also think there's economy around it. And it's going to be very interesting what happens over the next year with the e economics around our food systems, right? I, I mean, I think everybody's probably a little bit nervous about what's going to happen. And especially with, if we have to, if we stop refining, and I don't know if, if this is real, but it, from my understanding, the main fertilizer that we are using for commodity crops is the majority of what Americans eat, um, is, which is fast food and bad food and processed food. The, the nitrogen fertilizer is a byproduct of the refining of oil and natural gas. Is that wrong? Um, I don't know, so but you know what? I think it, that's a good. I think that's a good. That's a good. Uh, that's a good. Good uh, uh, point to, to to raise. It's like how are we supporting this large scale agricultural system. Right. So so if we're and I could you know I might be wrong about this. this is something I've just hypothesized over the last forty eight hours. I haven't done my research on it. But I do know that the fertilizer, the chemical fertilizer that's used, the nitrogen fertilizer is a byproduct of refining oil. Mm. And if, if our oil capacity is tanked, it's like it's full, do they stop refining oil? And mm. then is there going to be a limited supply of this chemical nitrogen fertilizer? And mm. what is that going to do to our food systems? Mm, 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 mm. That's a really good question. You know, it's funny. Okay, so so since we're already here, today is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, right? I wasn't thinking about yeah. that when when I asked you to get on the call. To be perfectly honest, right? Uh, it just so happened to be. Uh, but you talked about different levels of awareness of collapse that people might not be aware of. Um, do you want to help? I, I heard you do a talk on water before, right? Uh, with, uh, mm -hmm. with, with the Urban Ag series with the city, it was a couple years ago. Um, that was really eye opening. Do you want to like talk about the different layers of what's happening? Um, you know, just in terms of, you know, people being aware that this is Earth Day, but like, why is Earth Day necessary? and what is happening to our ecological systems, you know, that mandates us to, you know, unbound this ish, like right now. Right, so with climate change, the hydrological systems are getting um, a little tweaked. Nobody knows exactly what's gonna happen, but the with warming, um, the atmosphere holds more water. And so right now, I believe it's up to like four or 5% more moisture is in the atmosphere. So if you're, if you're like, oh my God, I can't believe how humid it is. It's not your imagination. It is really, we are having increased humidity. Um, and, um, and so there's the hydrological cycle, right? Which is evaporation and, um, and trans evaporation. So evaporation from lakes and streams and, and waterways and then trans evaporation, which is the way that the trees expire uh, moisture through their whole system. And as these things are getting a little bit out of whack, there is um, a h higher chances of, of deeper droughts happening in drought prone areas and then more extreme precipitation events in 
um, you know, like monsoon. So, so if you get a minute when we're done here, check out look, research um, images called rain bomb. And so this is happening in, in Arizona right now where there is so much water in these storm systems that they're dropping like three inches of rain in a matter of hours. And, and so we have this hydrological system, which has, uh, is changing. You know, as humans, we could say it's out of whack, but that's a, a human judgment on it, right? Or because that's saying that there's something wrong with it. For nature, it's just changing to adapt to the fact that destroying rainforests um, is destroying the, the river that the Amazon, um, and then there's the aquifers, which is the fossil water, right? So Midwest has these gigantic aquifers of fossil water that's being tapped out for agriculture. And fossil water is not a part of the hydrological cycle. It just happens to be these aquifers that are ancient. And we're draining those for agriculture. And corn in particular is very, loves water. The corn takes a lot of water to for an agriculture system. And then I was I was in Mexico City a few uh, winters ago, and Mexico City is dropping um, I don't know something like ten centimeters a year because wow. they shit. also have underground aquifers. It, it used to be a lake, you know, a long time ago, and it was drained, but there's aquifers under under the city and there's 25 million people sucking that water out so you know as with urban agriculture there's ways to, to trap and store water either through building healthier soils because we know that healthy soil holds water and it helps with extreme storm events and um and erosion problems. There is capturing water off of rooftops. Um, but but so when you are building ecosystems, the foundation of that, of course, is healthy soil. And that healthy soil holds, you know, so I don't know the exact number, but so much more water than than unhealthy soils or compacted soils or pavement or you know impervious surfaces uh and i it's it is another thing that's interesting about living up here is that we're the watershed for new york city mm -hmm. and so about 10 million people count on the water coming from the catskill mountains to be clean and so i, don't, I might have this this number wrong, but it's something like $15 million a year of New York tax money goes to um, riparian restoration projects up in the Catskills. And it's also uh, considered reverse development because the state buys large pieces of land when they come on the market to keep it pristine. And so then the flip side of that is because it's reverse development, it's very poor. There's an enormous amount of poverty up here. Um, and, and so we provide this extraordinary resource for 10 million people, right? But I don't know, again, is that kind of awareness thing? Do, do people in New York City understand that? where their water comes from? Do people in Richmond understand where their water comes from? And do they understand what happens when they flush the toilet? Right. And where, where it goes? Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what fascinating. Your poop? Right. <laughs> out of sight, out of mind, right? Like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If you haven't done it, go on a tour of the wastewater treatments plant in Richmond. It's so interesting. So yeah, they, they we uh we uh got a guy named Jeremy Hoffman who talks about uh stormwater management in in the city and how you know Richmond, Virginia has a combined sewer system, and because of it being combined, when it rains, 
the water that uh, is collected off of the streetscapes mixes in with the water from you know you flushing your toilet and running your faucet and you know washing your clothes and if it's been a heavy rain that it will overflow the waste water scenario the uh, the wastewater treatment and that water that overflow goes into the james river and um when people think about that it's like ew so my prescriptions my poop you know mixes with my armor all and <laughs> and whatever i'm washing my car mm -hmm. with <laughs> and it's going in the river so you know that has been a way of like hey man you're fucking up the planet when you know you don't have these green spaces uh you're messing up the planet when you know you pour grease down your toilet bowl or when you like change your oil and you just let it like filter into the parking lot and into the uh into the uh the sewer drains yeah and i, and I think that you know yeah that 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 type of like yes this affects you individually it does like shock people into like oh yeah i am a contributor to the <laughs> to the to the to the havoc that's happening to our ecosystem but at the same time it's like that only lasts for like i guess maybe like a couple minutes <laughs> like you know what i'm saying like people are like oh shit and then they like you know it just kind of like drifts off into oh yeah yeah i heard i heard about the 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 the, the combined sewer system but what you're talking about is a much bigger when your poo that after yeah i mean it's bigger than your so poo after it's... your poo <laughs> but after after your after your poo take travels down miles of pipes and goes through the wastewater treatment plant in richmond virginia it goes through um, a, a high heat process and all of the pathogens, E. coli, stuff like that's burned out of it. It's dried. And then the city of Richmond actually, this was eight, I, I don't know how much it is now, but this is eight, eight or nine years ago. They pay companies, agriculture, big ag companies or big fertilizer companies, they pay them $27 a ton so there's this massive hopper that tractor trailers pull underneath the, the building where the biosolids. Biosolids is the polite name for your, your adapt poo. And the biosolids are then spread on the commodity crop fields of soy and corn. And then that is fed to cows. You know, it's interesting because you're also talking about the interdependence of urban and rural uh, ecologies and like systems. Oh, and, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that like the cities, the city's poo becomes the fertilizer for the rural, you know, farms. Um, but I will say that in New York, um, in the Hudson Valley and stuff, like people who live in and around the aqueducts and the reservoirs, they're like awareness of the interdependence of the city and the rural is built into your life because yeah. it's all around you. Mm -hmm. People in New yeah. York turn on the faucet and brag about having the best drinking water in the world. And, you know, they don't necessarily know where it comes from. Right. So, but, but let's take it to another level. So that's like one, yeah. that's yeah. one aspect of the, of, of, the anthropocene right like the water is like jacked right so but let's talk about the other elements like because because from what I, I i remember going into uh i mean it's all interrelated but i remember going to hopewell right uh the with the honey honeywell complexes and i told the story just to kind of like paint the picture of how how sh uh how horrible it is right so this was back in 2000 ooh, had to be like 2004 maybe five i was driving to petersburg i was going to virginia state but i took a back road and i ended up um riding along one of the routes 
that um, uh, that lines up with the Honeywell complexes, right? So as I was driving, it was uh, drizzling, right? You know, it wasn't raining. It was just drizzle. And so the drizzle on my windshield, you know, I turned on my windshield wipers, and the drizzle on my windshield wipers was brown. Wow. From the particulate matter from the Honeywell plant, like, you know, as it was spewing off of its smoke, it was mixing in with the drizzle, right? And as I drove down, I was thinking to myself, damn, this is getting on people's skin. This is getting on people's lawns, on people's gardens, on people's houses, on, you know, people are breathing this in too, right? And of course, you know, it gets into the waterways, but this is the, the, so when we talk about like the implications for your poo, it's like the, uh, another layer is like the way that we handle uh, particulate matter in these urban areas is also you know uh putting out these pollutants into the air that is getting on our food stuffs that's getting on our skin and we're not you know we don't because we're because again out of sight out of mind because we don't live in hopewell right we don't live across the street from the honeywell factory we don't consider that the stuff that they burn off to make whatever it is that they make is also getting into our ecosystem and it and it and it and it you know no matter how much you regulate it these are the this is the this is wild stuff so when we talk about like levels of collapse um i think it's important also to throw in not just like the water piece but to also expand on like you know how is this getting into the air and then you know when we talk about biophilia or you know the green things like how we can plant like the trees that can help absorb some of these harsh elements you know what i mean anyway i, I just had to throw that in there because it's really fascinating to me uh what i what hurts me about human humankind like in this moment as it relates to the environment is like we don't really think about the shit once it leaves our you know 25 thousand square foot parcel of land that we might call our home right once if it's not in our immediate vicinity we're not considerate of the fact that the, that we are in nature like every second of the day we kind of think of like nature is something out there somewhere but um so essentially the the main problem of humanity is that we have been terrible with our waste management and in nature there is no waste so every every bit of waste so if you look at mycelium and bacteria and the relationship that they have around a rhizosphere which is the the root tip very you know microscopic the excretion of bacteria might be food for mycelium and and vice versa and so we have as humans basically failed at the project of waste management mm -hmm. so whether it's carbon dioxide which is invisible whether it's our landfills whether it's the scourge of plastic mm -hmm. you know cardboard holy moly how can there be so much cardboard on the planet that's what i don't understand <laughs> <laughs> where does it all come from <laughs> Oh, so, and I think that's a part of what, so in a, in a community garden, you have your compost and, and, and that's an enormous, like the, the tons, you know, another interesting thing that I did when I was in Richmond, I would take groups on, on a tour of the, the big, um, dump in Charles City, um, Shoesmith. Is that it? Shoesmith Brothers? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, no, wait. No, that was the one that was south. South of Richmond. One of the largest landfills in the United States is south of Richmond. The Shoesmith Brothers one. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, New York City is out of landfill space. And there are uh, tractor trailers and barges going 24-7 from the New York City metropolitan area to Virginia. 
and um, the oh, landfills. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Like like hundreds and to of tons of trash every single day is going down 95 and the intercoastal waterway and barges and being dropped off in s several landfills in Virginia, in central Virginia. But the, where it gets really complex is that it pays for the school system in Charles City County and part of Chesterfield County. Right, so how do you start to unravel that? That's insane. That's insane. So, so this is this is the complexity that we have set up as humans that we need to start to have real conversations about and really figure out how we unravel this because there's school systems that are dependent on the trash coming from New York City. The one, the Shoesmith brothers, they said about 50% I can't remember if it was by weight or by volume of the trash that's coming in from New York City is, is food, food waste, okay? The smell is not like anything I have ever experienced in my life, but it produces so much methane that they have it highly engineered that there's pipe, is it, it goes up in, it's like the Tower of Babel, but it's the Tower of Trash. <laughs> the Tower of Trash. And they have pipes running through all that tower of trash and it extracts the methane and that methane then runs through a power plant and they provide electricity for about 10,000 homes in that community so you know these are the thing these are the systems that we set up that we at one point thought was the right thing to do how do we start to unravel these very complex ways that we have managed our waste? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so uh, let's take it to another. Let's take it to a, another side uh, of of the conversation. Uh, you know, was, I was I was on this call earlier today and. Um, uh, Dr. Faith Harris, she's an uh, uh, environmental advocate, justice ag advocate uh, here in Richmond, uh, preacher woman. And so she, she, she threw this uh, frame, this, this frame out, framework out. She says, if, I, if, if you want to see how someone treats other people, look how they treat the planet. And I thought that was pretty profound um, because it made me think about like how, you know, when nobody's looking, how people, you know what I mean? Like how people interact with the planet. Um, but it also made me think about how foundational like our earth care work is uh, in terms of our, like our spiritual values, like our, our our very core values as 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 beings right on the planet, like our connection or lack thereof to nature. In many ways, in my at least in my uh, experience, is reflected in how we in, engage with the planet. Like in many ways, we commodify the planet. We can commodify, you know, the environment. The environment. And, you know, as such, when we engage with other people, it's like we're just using those people. It's not like you have a true relation, you know what I mean, with them. So Yeah, it's transactional. Yeah, it's a very transactional thing. It's not like, you know, I have a sincere care for the planet. It's like I'm, I, I'm, I'm getting something out of this, you know what I'm saying? And it's not like this is just for the pure sake of the love and care that I'm here you know, with it. So I, I wanted it, I wanted to bring it back because you talked in the early part of our conversation, you brought this idea of spiritual ecology. Um, and I wanted to go back to that uh, and, and at least um, have you expound a little bit about what, what does that mean for you or how does that, how do you wrap your brain around that, uh, especially being that Minla and in uh, and, and such a like constant state of like there's philosophy and spirituality on a day-to-day -day basis like wrapped around that space 
sometimes we even have shamans running around shaking rattles and banging drums and building little earth altars all over the place. <laughs> it's so different than living in Richmond, Virginia. Oh, <laughs> um, you know, I think, you know, I have this theory that one of the reasons that the United States has become such a, it's, we're just obnoxious and we're violent and we take whatever we want. Um, is that we're a country of immigrants, which has a lot of good things, but I think the drawback is that being a country of immigrants and also being a very, um, uh, what's the word, where people move a lot. They don't Maybe. stay in one place for a long time. You know, we're transient. You know, some people do, but generally people move for jobs and they move for college or they move for their family or they move because they don't like the weather. Um, and when you when you're transient and when you're an immigrant, I don't know, may, I'm gonna leave the immigrant, I'm gonna reverse the immigrant part. I'm gonna, let's roll that one back and, and leave it. Let's just say transient. When, when a culture is very transient, we don't stay in one place long enough to, to really get to know it and fall in love with it. And I think it does come from a place of awe and love. Mm -hmm. And so we might have a, a beloved, it might be a human, it might be a cat, and mm -hmm. a, or it might be a place. And so it's this idea of the beloved and if you don't stay in one place long enough to learn about it and to develop a relationship with it, you're not going to ever know how to really love it and take care of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that is, you know, a big part of it is the, the awe and respect that we can have for each other as humans. Also, we can have if you take the time to be quiet and look and understand how amazing the relationships are between, you know, with all the relationships that are happening in an ecosystem, if that doesn't blow one's mind, I don't know what, what could, but you have to be still enough to really see it. And you have to be still enough to see it over a number of years, right? Like so an oak tree, one of the keystone species of a forest system, it grows for 300 years, it's still for 300 years, and it dies for 300 years. And so when we're looking at an, an ecological time system that's like that, like then we're just puny. We're really puny. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think when, when we can be humbled, you know, when we can be humble, like here in this, va this little valley that I live in, I'll show you, you can see it out of my window. It's not a very big valley. You know, when the wind comes whipping through this valley, we have 320 acres here, um, and we're surrounded by the Catskill Preserve. And then when the wind comes whipping through this valley, like the terror that I feel as I see these massive trees just bending and swaying, and I know that really we're just puny. So I, I think it's, it's there, like with humans, we, we have, we've grown kind of this arrogance that we can blow up mountains and we can, we can frack. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> right. Um, and we can do deep sea oil d drilling where they go in miles of ocean and then miles of the seabed. Oh, so I, you know, I, again, and I, I just think it has to do with learning how to be quiet because we, 
a lot of people have, we're so busy or we, we say we're really busy because I don't think we really are, but we use that. Like I'm too busy. Right. 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 I don't think, I don't think anybody's really that busy. Mm. Unless you have a lot of children, then, okay, then you, yeah, you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> or even one. Right. Like, you have like, obligations to other people. That, that works. <laughs> <laughs> I have offspring to care to. I can, you know, I can deflect. <laughs> yeah. But otherwise, like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> and and you know, all of this, even in Christianity and and in Buddhism and in Islam and Judaism, there's all some kind of connection to nature and to respecting the earth. But greed, man. Greed has is is some powerful stuff. So um, let's shift let's shift uh, gears here a little bit. Um, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about nonprofits. Um, you know, you decided to start a nonprofit. Um, you know, I've I've been in the nonprofit industrial space for a while, um, for a lot of my career. Uh, so you know. When you left Tricycle, you know, like what were some lessons that you that you learned about being in the nonprofit space doing this type of work? You know, because a lot of people on the call are folks that are, you know, dedicated to this type of work through some sort of nonprofit lens, um, with the exception of a few. I know some of us are for profit and trying to do some things. But what are some lessons that you learned in that nonprofit space um, that you would feel comfortable sharing, you know, with with with, uh, with folks that aspire to engage in this work, you know, through phil using philanthropy as a as a as a tool or a weapon to like uh, I don't know like well you know I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna be honest I am I am um, I think. Richmond, Richmond's legacy around slavery makes it a really twisted place to be involved in philanthropy. Mm, 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 mm. Um, I think that the, and I don't know if it's like this in other cities because I only experienced it in the culture of Richmond, Virginia. Mm -hmm. You know, where we are here, it's, it's very different. Um, uh, operates almost entirely on programmatic um, monies coming in. We're shut down now with, with coronavirus. We don't know. I have been deemed essential because I grow food, which is the first time anybody's been like, wow, you're essential all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> but we're pretty much shut down and even some management are going on to unemployment. Wow. Um, you know, but it's so, so here our as a, we're a nonprofit, but most, the majority of our money comes in from programs. Mm -hmm. That being said, because of who these people are once a year, they have a big concert and, you know, like Iggy pop and Philip Glass and Patty Smith and, and, and these people all come together and they play at Carnegie Hall once a year and they raise a shit ton of money and it's really awesome. And they're all, you know, come on, Patty Smith, Iggy Pop. These are radical people in the eyes of Richmond, Virginia. Would not roll in the Richmond philanthropic scene. Okay? So... What I experienced in Richmond, Virginia is that there's an extraordinary split in because of race and because of the history of civil war or the civil war. So there's the public sector, which is the government, and there's the private sector, which is corporations and the main philanthropic dollars. They don't give a shit about changing anything structurally. Right. They like to have their opera. They like to have their botanical garden. They like to have their ballet. They like to have their art. Mm. And, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. All those are beautiful. I love a botanical garden. Opera could give or take. Mm. 
Art, <laughs> you know, it's fine. Ballet, it's beautiful stuff, right? But right now, because of the way the tax system has worked, and I, and I can go on a tear, I can go on a rant on this stuff. Because we have shifted in this country from the idea of the common good coming from taxpayers supporting systems that are healthy for all mm -hmm. to the corporate money deciding who they want to support mm -hmm. and expecting a fat pat on the back for it mm -hmm. they are not interested in system change mm -hmm. at all and if you let me grab a book <sighs> If you guys have not heard of this guy yet, look him oh, up. Oh, wow, yeah. Thing. Very nice. So essentially what's happened is that the corporate set, which, and, and I'm going to be, again, I'm going to be completely honest with you guys. I've, I've nothing to lose. I'm not a racist. I'm not a sexist, but I'm a corporatist. Mm -hmm. And I have a really big bone to pick with corporate America. Mm. I'm not a fan. I don't want I don't want anything to do with them. And they are the ones that are managing the way our philanthropic dollars right now are being spent. Right. Although, you know, this with this COVID-19 right now, everything's going to change. I don't know. Nobody knows what's going to happen, but I personally think it's kind of exhilarating. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, quietly, uh, you know, we've been having conversations about it. It's like, yo, as, 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 as horrible as this shit is, it's kind of like, uh, it's bitter. It's, it's it's a bittersweet situation because it's grinded so much of the shit that we didn't need to a fucking halt. And you're really seeing like, what do you really need? You know what yeah, I mean, versus like, what do you want, right? And mm -hmm. <laughs> it's fascinating to, to to see these people protest to open up the economy uh, again uh, because like. Dude was like, I'm going to file a suit against the governor because my gym is non-essential. <laughs> he was like, yo, I'm going to sue the government so I can open up my gym again, which is like, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and, and again, where I am here, I've been involved in some other nonprofits and but it's not it doesn't have the legacy of slavery up here it doesn't have the race issues happening up here and so there is philanthropic money flowing here but it's very different there's one organization called the good work institute that i've been involved in and there's a guy named micah who's he's african-american and um the first meeting I went to with them, he started the meeting by acknowledging the indigenous people who had lived on that land, mm -hmm. who were displaced by the white settlers. Mm -hmm. You know, and he didn't even acknowledge his blackness, his mm -hmm. race, his potential link to slavery. I don't know what his history is. But I thought, you know, if that were to happen in Richmond, Virginia, to acknowledge not only the indigenous people, but then to go, you know, into history a little further and acknowledge slavery, mm -hmm. it just would not fly. You right. would, it just wouldn't work. I was, I was weeping. Mm. I could not believe it. And this person, this, this nonprofit is supported by some big philanthropic dollars and things that you would probably know. You know, so I think Richmond, Virginia is a particularly difficult situation because of the legacy of slavery. And what I experienced working with in both the black community and the white community is that it's alive and festering in 
different ways on right. um, both sides of the race line. Almost definitely. I definitely concur. Um, you know, over the last five years, just really like digging in on this conversation about racial equity, it's been, yo, I'm going to write a book about my experiences. Um, working at Lewis Ginter afforded me the opportunity to have the very same conversation that I was having before I worked at Lewis Ginter. And, you know, it was fascinating to see how swiftly doors opened when I had, you know, a business card that said I worked at one of the whitest places in the city, right? But before those same people would have, wouldn't have batted an eye, I could have been, you know, I was the guy that was walking on the side of the road when they intentionally pushed their car into the, you know, into the rain puddle or the splash. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But <laughs> when I got to Lewis Ginner, it was like a different conversation. So, you know, now being on the other side of working for Lewis Ginner, what I'm also looking forward to is seeing how uh, me not being at Lewis Ginter, uh, how people show up or not as a result of me not being attached to, you know, this elite uh, organization. Because I always said that it's like, you know, I had a meeting with Steve Markell, right? When I was at Lewis Ginter. I don't think I would have got a meeting with Steve Markell if I hadn't been at Lewis Ginter. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I doubt it. I sincerely doubt it. But now that I'm not at Lewis Ginter, you know, I wonder if that, I wonder if I would, if he would make his stuff accessible. <laughs> Uh, you know, and I'm black. As a black man, like walking into these rooms and spaces, it's been, um, you know, uh, I, 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 I often want to set fire to the whole shit and just burn it down too. You know what I mean? I just say that because I feel like people, <laughs> people, <laughs> people want to be associated with the monies, man. It's not that they really want to change. They want to be associated with you know, the trappings of, of, of classism that, that, that come along with the shit. But when it comes down to like the real work that's necessary, it's like, yo, I don't give a shit about your logo, you know, or, you know, the thank you letters or whatever the fuck like that. You know what I mean? Like that's like, it's, it's, it's the trappings and the way that we massage these choreographies of philanthropic investment like that. It's all bull that that is bullshit to me, and I've seen it be uh, bullshit on a, on a, on a regular basis. I I'll just use the, another example. Uh, I used to think that I had made some. I, I thought when I was doing nonprofit work, when we got like ten thousand dollars, I you know I swear to God I almost I probably would have had like I got lightheaded like holy shit it's ten thousand dollars. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. When I got to Lewis Ginner, bro, like it was like, you know, that was nothing. I mean, literally, yeah. that was nothing. Mm -hmm. Like people like dropping six figures, you know, in their capital campaign, you know, anonymous donors putting million dollars, you know, checks to building up places on, on on the botanical garden ground. And I was like, yo, like this dude just gave seven million dollars, pledged seven million dollars anonymously. He didn't even want his name attached to the thing. And so we out here trying to fight against poverty, racial inequity, and we got down hype about ten thousand dollars. Insanity. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, 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 it's yeah. crazy. So you know to bring it back, you know what I mean? That I definitely I definitely think that's a good insight that, you know, race does play a, a pivotal role and also just um you know, in terms of getting funding that there are racial disparities in that space. Uh what's something else you think might be a good lesson or something a jewel or something that you learn engaging in the nonprofit space and um and uh in in your work with Tricycle that you might think it might be good for folks to know as they enter in that space? You know, I think kind of one of these commonly accepted ratios that there's a certain amount of money that comes from programming and a certain amount of money that comes from, from grants and then individual donors. I think, 
you know, the, the, the thing is to figure out how to have an income stream and not to be dependent on donors. Um, you know, because I think once you start getting money from, from corporations and, and from some individuals, it can muddy the, the depth of conviction that you start the program with, that you start your idea, that you start your vision with. Because people like to buy silence. Hey. <laughs> what was, okay. I like that. That's true. Mm -hmm. Very true. Yeah. What can't and you so say I as a result of getting that funding? Yeah, exactly. So I think is figuring out a way to be as independent as possible. And I mean, we're really stuck between a hard, a rock and a hard place in this country right now because of the economic disparity. Mm. You know, the rich, they're just like vacuum cleaners that have sucked up every drop of blood that they could. And this coronavirus is really exposing the fact that this system is built on the backs of the people who are making the least amount of money to do the hardest work. And got the nerve to call them you know, essential. That <laughs> shit is bizarre. Essential. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that shit is insulting. It's like, I'm essential, but I get paid fucking seven, eight dollars an hour. What the? F <laughs> what kind of shit is that? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, I got, I left that experience in uh, in Richmond really and again I think it is really particular to the history of Richmond right because of the history of slavery and where the money came from to build up some of these companies mm -hmm. so the insurance industry for example was really started in Richmond Virginia because they were insuring slaves mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so insurance is a really big business and and you look at philip morris it was built on the backs of slaves and tobacco right. the tobacco industry right 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 for sure and until there's a real discussion about the these kinds of issues i don't really see it changing not at all Nice. And I don't know how to launch these discussions because in the black community, it's uncomfortable. And in the white community, it's just something to be swept under the rug. I don't, I don't have an answer to this at all. And I do believe that Richmond is in a really particularly difficult situation around it. Yeah, I will say this, man. Um, I'm sorry to <laughs> No, it's all good. I mean, not nah, so. My lived experience is one where you know, because of what opportunities are granted to you as a as a person of color, as a black person, when you don't bring that shit up, you know, it's like upward mobility, you know, class wise. The less you speak about you know, slavery, Jim Crow, racism, white supremacy, if you leave those words out of your lexicon, right, you can get a swift track to the big house. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Wow. And, you know, there's certain rewards afforded to you by, you know, being nice and being polite, like being like, I, I feel like for me, you know what I'm saying? I feel like I've earned the right to, you know, be, to critique the system. You know what I mean? Like I've, I've worked mm -hmm. in government, I've worked in nonprofit, you know what I'm saying? And I've lived all my life as a black man in Richmond, right? So I, I feel like I've seen some shit, right? But uh, the moment you, the, mo the moment you speak truth to power, the cognitive dissonance of uh, very wealthy or influential white folks kicks in, right? And it creates an ostracizing of you from 
other black people, right, that are comfortable in their spaces. And for you to be bringing up those issues, they kind of had to be held accountable. They, they had to take account to that, to the other, to the white folks that are uncomfortable by the conversation. So it's like, mm -hmm. you know, nah, bro, tone it down. I will never forget. There was a black philanthropy, philanthropic group in Richmond. We applied for funding for them. From this is a group of black people who were putting money to invest philanthropically into initiatives in the city. We applied for them, applied for funding for them when I was with Renew with John Lewis, right? How about they denied us, right? And the word got back to me. The reason why we were denied is because they said I was too militant, right? Said that, and this is a group of black. People in a room putting $1,000 a piece on the table to invest, to make a difference in specifically black communities. But because I talk about racism, white supremacy, and didn't really give a shit who liked it or who didn't, they said I was too militant. It's not like I was running around with a shotgun at the front of you know, the General Assembly or some shit like that. You know, I'm just speaking my mind right. my <laughs> shit. so you know that is an example of how even within communities of color like there's a there's an embedded conditioning to not bring up the systemic issues and the root causes of the issues that these that our communities face because you might piss some piss the wrong people off, you know, or they're not ready to have that kind of conversation. You know what I mean? And so yeah. in Richmond, yeah. Virginia is weird because you know the first families of Virginia are it's not like it's it's not like you go up to other places like this. You go to Reveille Church, these are the same families that have been involved in Reveille Church are, you know, this is generation to generation that's been passed down, right? And so those folks have created what I like to call a polite oppression, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's, it's like, we're going to marginalize your community, but we're going to do it with a smile. And you shake your hand. Yeah, we're sorry. I mean, you know, yeah, you guys should pull yourself up by the bootstrap, that type of shit, right? But it's never, yeah. it's never a critique of, hey, the folks that came on the ship from England into Virginia got 50,000 acres of land and took it from indigenous people. Like, nobody wants to talk about that shit, like, right? But or nobody wants to talk about, you know, even now they might want to talk about the redlining, but it's not like they want to talk about it in a way that they're going to do some shit about it. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, we know that the Talheimers made bank off, you know what I'm saying, white flight and, you know, selling homes mm -hmm. and uh, formerly breadline communities. We know that the banks made buku bread off of subprime lending, you know, in these black communities. But nobody's like really trying to undo that shit. <laughs> it's like, let's put a bandaid on it. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be all right. So, you know, it's a really... Yeah, and so I think that's, that's why talking about structural and systemic change um, is something that we have to have a, such a depth of conviction in order to be able to continue it. Because we will, things might change. Things really might change over the next few months, you know, but... Um, because I, th I think a lot is being exposed right now. Mm. But I, you know, again, I just, I really think Richmond, Virginia, until there is a public acknowledgement of the cruelty and the destruction of a, a massive number of people, I mean, I, th I think a lot of people don't even know that, that in Shaco Bottom, they were breeding humans. 
I mean, most people in Richmond don't know this. And I've told some people up here this story, and they're like, no way. You know, I, that cannot be true. And then I, I'll, you know, I'll say, I'll send them a link or I'll, I'll show them an article. I'm like, it's true. In Richmond, Virginia, they were breeding black people like livestock. And it has never been acknowledged. It's not public information. And until that wound is discussed, Richmond is not going to be able to move out of the darkness where it is. You know, I'm sorry to say this, but this is my, you know, maybe it's just my opinion, but it was also my experience. Yeah, that's what we talk about. Because the level of denial is deep. Hey, you guys, I, I want to point out something. Just like uh, Deron said, that you can't bring up, uh, you know, like, as a Black person, you can't bring up uh, uh, like racism and, you know, talk about it in general because it's like, oh, there he goes again type of shit. Mm -hmm. uh, well, from like a, a, a white guy experience in like the, you know, punk rock and hardcore scene and, you know, activisms um your king should have fucked mountain if that's all you talk about all day and i mm -hmm. think that's an interesting disparity that mm. um doesn't get brought up much mm. um interesting break that down talk talk to, speak on that a wait, little bit so yeah, I, I, uh, so, so yeah i, I want to understand that a little more so if um i'm i'm you know jason white guy and uh I, I go out and I'm like, oh wow, uh, I, I'm woke. I, I get woke one day mm. and um, I start talking about it and uh, I start, you know, whooping it up about how like fucked up things are and how, um, uh, how just how the system's broken, basically talking about it. Mm. It's much easier for me to like uh, gain ground mm. in um, activism circles or uh, like gain community mm -hmm. than it is, I think, for um, people of color right. to like gain ground in organizing circles. Wow. Um, now I've seen some change, you know, recently. Uh, I think a, a lot of people have learned, um, you know, like when to shut up. Um, and I think that's like a, a, a major thing because um, there's that power hunger thing that I've seen go around and you know people people want the stage and it's and it's no different than you know having the land ownership stage to having the bulk of the um activism cred right um that's, that, that's wow that that's out. fascinating i love thank you for bringing that up that's real i you know so yeah, you know, I'm gonna just keep it 100, man, and fully transparent and authentic. I've really been fucking wrestling with how fucked up it is the way things went, you know, uh, with uh, you know the garden and that lose dinner and shit. You know what I'm saying? It's really been bothering me, but I I haven't really talked a lot about it. I just kind of like been keeping it, you know, what I'm saying between me and my partner and just dialogue. But what I've realized, the lessons that I'm learning in this moment is that you know there's there's a lot of there's a lot of rhetoric you know what i mean about uh racial equity you know from philanthropic circles and nonprofits and shit you know what i'm saying or even like quote unquote activist circles right but when it comes time to like actually align you know that rhetoric with values that are manifest through behaviors and actions, you know, in alliance with communities of color, that should be empty as fuck. You know what I'm saying? And and and, and it and it's like, I love it. You know what I mean? I love I love to hear folks talk about, you know, ally this and, and that. And but I, I've I've got to the point where like I don't want an ally, I need an accomplice. You know what I mean? Like who's gonna be <laughs> ready to who's gonna be ready to like help me pick the lock? You know what I mean? Like, you know, if we gotta run up and break that bitch, like who's gonna who's gonna who's gonna be willing to catch the charge with me? You know what I'm saying? Matter of fact, who's gonna take the charge and be like, yo, I did it. If even though I had even though I I I went at the shit with the fucking ring. You know what I'm saying? 
So I mean, it's 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 deep because it's like you could use like like with people when it comes time to use the privilege. It's like it, it it's a really weird space because you can't expect. I, I I've I've learned not to expect people to do, you know, anything that would compromise their life and liberty, you know, in behalf of the cause of racial justice. That's just insane, right? Like, why would you do that? But at the same time, I hear I hear people espouse, you know what I mean, that they are that they that they're ready to ride to really dismantle systems, and then in many ways, the dismantling of these systems will cost, you know, you or any or or any white person, like you have to sacrifice your whiteness to a degree. You know what I'm saying? Like it, your your privilege is gonna have to, you know, you're gonna have to you have to fall on the sword, you know what I'm saying? And, and lose that shit in order to really shift the system. You know what I mean? Because it's those white folks that don't want to talk about the shit that, you know, actually invest in whiteness and like prop up whiteness and kind of create that wall that it's because like, it's, it's that wall that, they kind of like, these are the rewards of whiteness. Like you don't have to talk about this shit. You know what I'm saying? And if you don't talk about this shit, you'll keep your friends, you'll keep your circles of influence, your people will stay down with you, you know, but the moment you start like holding other white people accountable, then you might like lose influence, lose access to jobs, lose access to, you know what I mean? Shit. So it's a really rugged, rugged cross the bear to be in that space and um you know for me i i I just kind of got to the point where i'm like yo i mean i understand like there's going to be a point we're going to be in a car together and it will be a point where you might not you know any 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 uh, quote unquote ally might not be able to go any further you know what i'm saying and i'd be thankful for the fact that we were able to ride in the car to whatever point that we can ride into you know what i'm saying to be like all right boom if this is where i gotta get out just give me a heads up bro <laughs> don't leave me in the motherfucking car where you done jumped out the jaw and I'm looking like who I thought he was driving. I'm <laughs> who's at the wheel? <laughs> but I use that analogy like so, that's how I felt when I was at Lewis Guinness. Like I felt like they jumped out the car and I was still riding in that bitch. <laughs> and, I looked, and there was nobody in the driver's seat. <laughs> And then I had to jump out and do a barrel roll and shit, get up, you know. All right, I'm good. But uh, they crashed the car. If you had told me it was going to get out, we could have pulled but, you up. You know, I, I do. I, I, I also worked in the city of Richmond government at the uh, request of the mayor. So I was working at a pretty high level. It was only six months. But I was the only white person working in a... And it didn't, that didn't go well either. You know, I didn't, I, it was, I was very naive walking into that. And there was a lot of animosity thrown at me coming in with this, you know, like, hi, let's, I'm white and I'm here to help. Let's, uh, you know, let's, let's grow some tomatoes together. And that was, did not go well. (laughs) So. You know, I think it's, it's there's a lot of, a lot of understanding and misunderstanding and opportunities for us to uh, to build this future together that is more equitable and, and fairer and built on compassion. And the fear, I think there's so much fear right now in this country because of the disparity. Mm. You know, and there's people who, like, they'll fight harder for their right for a plastic grocery bag than they will for health care. You know what I mean? Like, why don't we have universal health care? But people are not going to fight for that, but they're going to get so indignant if you ban plastic bags in a grocery (laughs) store. (laughs) Like it's weird. I know. I just like I can't even wrap my head around. It's the word the freedom. Basic things that people. Freedom. <laughs> Would you say freedom? The word freedom yeah. and the the uh, interpretation of the right around that. They should be able to do whatever they want. It's kind of real fucked up. It's like they took like a cool thing like anarchism and you just said only mine. 
and that's mm -hmm. like how that side runs their ship. Yeah. Hey guys, um, I have a two-part question. Okay, so you we're talking about funders and everything. Um, do you see any opportunities to like educate them or like kind of change that process and that conversation? And then the second question is, um, you're talking about the other ways just to figure out a way to be as independent as possible. Um, from your experience, like, what do you see, see, how do you see that on a ground level? Like, where does that come from? Does it come from the staff? Because it usually doesn't come, you know, top down in a organization. So I'll start with the education part. In my experience, generally people who have a lot of money think that they own the truth. And it's really hard for them to open up and, and look to what other people have to say. And especially when it comes to, um, no, I'm not gonna go down that road. Uh, yeah, so wealthy people, People with the money and the power think that they already know more. Um, I know that there are all kinds of conferences and opportunities for um, for people in the, the, the philanthropic world is an industry in itself, right? And so in philanthropy, there's all kinds of conferences and seminars and consultants and, and what have you. I think the thing is, is, is to find the um, philanthropic people who are already aligned with your mission and with your heart. Because there are a lot of philanthropic dollars that are going towards really amazing work. Um, and maybe it's happening in Richmond and I'm just not aware of it because I've been away for a long time. Um, there's the, um, they changed the name of it recently. What is it? They, they joined up with GuideStar. It was the, um, the foundation. The There's a, foundation. A, this massive, no, it's a massive database. It's, it's, it's national. If you go to the public li the main public library in Richmond, you can access it for free. You need to ask them about it. It costs like a thousand dollars a year to access this as a organization, but you can search, you can use terms to search for whatever it is that you um, are, what your work is about. And you can find where the philanthropic money is around, say, spiritual ecology or race and the environment or food justice, whatever. And then you, you, with that, you can, you can find out who they're donating to. And then you can research these organizations and see what their work is about. They, they changed their name recently, but if you go to the, to the reference part of, the, of any main public library branch, it is, you can access it for free. Um, so I, I, think, I think it's a, a bit of a black hole to, to think that we can educate people who already think they know a lot. Um, and instead, spend your energy finding people who you are are already aligned with um and then the second part of your question about the the earned income is really figuring out programs and with food it's very it's difficult because there's still an idea that food should be free or very very cheap and a lot of people don't understand the collateral damage that our food systems have created to the environment, which are very expensive, and the collateral damage that they have incurred to migrant farm workers, to um, you know the, the capos, the, the concentrated animal feedlots, to the, the, the level of inhumane systems that have been set up that have damaged humans and animals and the planet. And so we in this country spend a very, a very small percentage of our dollars on food. Because these systems have made it very cheap. 
And so I think, again, this is where we're in, a, a, in between a rock and a hard place. And it's really about creating systemic change, which might be happening for us right now. You know, ah. the, UN, the UN released a report today that they're expecting 275 million people to go into severe um, famine this year. It's doubled. Because, and it's mostly in developing countries, of course, um, but that doesn't, it still affects us because it's, we're all part of the same human family. Um, so I think that shift if, is, it's so interesting. It is so interesting right now. You know, and so with, with a nonprofit, you know, there's the selling of food, there's the, the added value of making some kind of product, um, any kind of medicinal tinctures and, and salves and teas, that's a really great way to, to increase your income stream. And of course, any kind of, of programs and teaching, but it's, we are in interesting times. I gotta say, um, I agree with uh, Lisa in that regard. Um, you know, there's an additional hurdle for for people of color to be able to access people with money, like that have like the financials. It's like a leap and a bound to be able to even get in the room. And then because you know you might not have as much money, just to echo what she said, it's like the way that our society engages people with money is as if they have some sort of spiritual like gift or like they are chosen they are the chosen like they like <laughs> the way we lift people with money on a platform they condescend to people who don't have money so no matter how smart or intelligent you might be if you don't have the same amount of money in the bank account as them they don't you know it's like they talk down to you and i i i i, I saw that firsthand, like being in rooms with people, I'm like, yo, I'm articulating all the things that the data has shown and science has proven and, you know, they, and, but they still think they know better than the leading experts on the topics, you know what I mean? Um, and then on top of that, like the fact that I got some melanin, like I, I saw the energy shift like when I was in a room with Markel by myself, having a conversation, very defensive, very like, you know, he, he was, he was, his, he, you could see he was uncomfortable, like talking to me, right? Yeah, and that's it, they get really defensive. Right, and then when I came in the mm -hmm. room with, uh, with, a, with, with Shane Tippett, the executive director at Lewis Ginner, his whole vibe was different. His whole energy was 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 on another. He was receptive and laughing and joking and ha 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 and kiki ki and shit. But when I was in the room by myself with him having coffee, he wanted to bait me and shit. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's different for me as a person of color enter into those rooms too. So and 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 that's a problem because I can't be human. You know what I'm saying? When I go into the room, I gotta be superhuman. I gotta be the super smartest motherfucker on the planet. You know what I mean? I gotta be super fucking polite. Gotta watch how I talk. Because if I say anything that might be off-putting to this dude, then conversation's done. You know what I mean? So this is the way class and race, for me, in the sex, uh, you know, when I'm in these spaces, I'm like, yo, I'm just, I, I'm, I just wanna be fucking heard and have a conversation and be seen as a human being of with value and ideas that are uh, clear, coherent, you know what I mean? I shouldn't have to fight to, you know, just get in the room with you. And I've refused to do that shit because it, it's, for me, it's like, unless, I, I'm, not, I'm not that guy. I'm not trying to like, you know, climb a 50 foot wall to have a conversation with somebody that's gonna look down on me. For what? Like, I'd rather, I'd rather rally with the people, man. Um, so long story short, if, you know, these folks that are 
wealthy want to shift, that has to be something that they have to, you know, accelerate and seek on their own. And it's very rare that I see it. And it's usually when I see it, it's with people that have new money. It's not with people that have had money and grew up with money. It's like there's a whole culture that comes with that. Um, but there are folks that are got that that are new to money and they might have made it in the last couple of years and they really trying to burn this shit down too. And I'm looking for them. Like, yo, let's get together and like let's tear this tear the system apart, you know, piece by piece and refashion it in a, in a way that it serves everybody. So yeah. I feel like there's more issues with that. Yeah. I feel like there's some issues that if the people without money see you even talking to the people that have the money, then they don't really want to be around you. Like, then you can't even get into those circles anymore because they see that you're going to the enemy and they're like, they feel that you sold them out almost. This is something I've Oh, that's interesting. I've seen that too. I mean, I personally, I've had people felt like, what's weird for me is like, some people have tried to, when I started working for Lewis Ginner, people tried to call me a sellout because I got a job at the Botanical Garden. And it was weird because it's like, bruh, like, do you see my resume? Do you know what I've been doing my entire career? The fact that I work at Lewis Ginner, now I'm a sellout? Like, hold up, wait a minute. Like, that, 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 that discounts all of the shit that I've done. But for me, I walked into Lewis Ginter with all authenticity. I didn't switch up on anybody, you know what I'm saying? So when I go into the hood and into the communities that I'm from, it's the same person that works at Lewis Ginner, that worked at Lewis Ginner that was, that existed before working at Lewis Ginner. I didn't throw a suit and tie on and try to change up my patterns of speech or, you know what I mean, my style of dress to try to make, you know, the folks in that bougie elite space feel comfortable. In fact, I try to make them, I try to be as real with them as possible, as humanly, as, as, as real as they can handle. And so as a result, I was able to, I'm, I was able to double dutch between the worlds. You know what I'm saying? Like I live in Northside, like on North Avenue and I grew up in Southside. So, you know, credibility and uh, authenticity, I always maintain that, but it's, but it's, it's a weird thing because there are people that were not familiar with the work who was like, oh, he worked at Lewis Ginner. Oh, he must be. It was like, bro, you got to look a little closer. Like, look at look at what we've done as a result of access to the resources. But the folks that doubt it, that doubt you, that may doubt you because you are able to access those spaces, you know, I question, sometimes I question their, their, uh, their genuineness, you know what I'm saying, in this, because there's, there's a subtle jealousy that also seeps in when you, as a black person, have proximity to white folks. Like when you have close, as a black man or a black woman, when you have proximity to wealth and white and whiteness, like other black people who have not really found their niche or their, you know, calling, kind of got there's a little jealousy that peeks out in that shit. It's weird, man, and it's it's deep. I I I I'll just leave it there. It 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 it'd be it's a challenge uh, because. You know, there's some internalized racism that also lives in these spaces that we got to detox from and heal from because it's like, you know, being close to whiteness and white people, especially whiteness and white people with money, is seen as having higher levels of freedom. And, uh, uh, you know, like you can move around, you have a lot more mobility. And, you know, there was always somebody on the plantation that was like, uh, look at him. He think he better than us because he in the house. Uh. Have you seen the movie Sorry to Bother You? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Just it's like, like that. If you guys haven't you. seen Sorry to Bother You, watch it. Yeah. Just like the sorry to bother you. Or even, um, you know, there's a movie saying Kofa, you know what I'm saying? There's like these different movies that played it out. But I mean, and I hate to be like, that's a trope, but it has validity in terms of black people and internalized racism. I mean, look, you see it in colorism. Yeah, I mean, 
like light skin versus dark skin and shit like that. It's 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 little ways that that shit pokes out yeah. like those the demons yeah. that we need to detox from. But yo, so okay, it's eight forty one, and we've been rocking for about an hour and some change. So look, anybody, I I, I want to wind this up in a nice package. Um, yeah, if anybody else has any questions, go ahead, throw them out there. Um, uh, before we close out, um, but I want to uh, land this plane nice and gently <laughs> with some closing remarks, or at least some some closing thoughts from from Lisa. Cool. I would love to ask about like the early stuff of um, the early history of tricycle, and you mentioned that um, you wanted you you were thinking about ecology, um, but then kind of um, and we're thinking about building community and and um, ways that garden spaces did that. But then that you you mentioned earlier that you weren't expecting to get into the race stuff, and you you touched on that a little bit in talking about like going into city Richmond government and the dynamics there. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm someone who has, I've been living in Richmond for two and a half years and um, live in Fulton and I actually work in the garden and I ate one of the gardens that you were part of help setting up in Fulton. Um, oh, the NRC. Yeah. Um, and, but so I think, and like Churchill has changed a lot. Right, and so I'm kind of interested in what the dynamics in Churchill were with that first garden and the first few gardens, and how you kind of saw that change over your ten years. You know, well, I think one of the things, and and I had a couple of white people and a couple of black people say to me when I was starting up, you know, or when we were starting it, is that you know the, that black people they they're they're not into this. They don't want to do it. They did it they did it in slavery and they're, they, they're done. They, that even growing a, a, some food in a community garden is too close to the history of slavery for them because, you know, slaves were forced to do agriculture mainly. And I, I was like, no, how, I don't, how could that be true? How could be having a, you know, 40 square feet be considered anywhere related to slavery but i was wrong and there is then that's why i i keep saying that there has to be some kind of acknowledgement of what slavery has done in richmond virginia around agriculture so you know there was that part of it and i also it got back to me that black the black communities or some not the whole community i'm not going to do a sweeping generalization but that people were saying, oh, the white people are coming in and taking our land, which, you know, I, sh I can understand where they're coming from, but that certainly was never my intention. And we had all kinds of community meetings and all the city council people that were up there were always a part of it and always part of the discussion. But, you know, there was always just a few dissenters and a few people who were really, um, aggravated by what we were doing and one of the things that we did with the churchill association and this was really heartbreaking in um chimborazo park is that we got a grant uh, i can't remember how much it was it was substantial enough that we bought something like 250 fruit trees mm -hmm. to make a community orchard in chimborazo and it was mostly in the, the lower part of chimborazo park and we planted we had this huge community work days and actually the city came in with a massive auger and helped dig really big holes and we got i don't know 150 250 fruit trees in well one weekend at night some people went in and they pulled out like 80 percent of the trees that we had put in wow that's crazy wow Yes, no. And that was after that is when somebody told me that yeah they don't they're they're not into the white people coming in to Church Hill and taking over the you know taking over their land and it was really shocking to me I don't know who did it I don't know who was saying these things I don't even know if that was true 
but it was something that I did experience there. And, and then when I worked for the city of Richmond, I, and this is a, a really deep, dark story. There was somebody named Carolyn Graham, Dr. Carolyn Graham, who was the head of social services. And um, it turns out that she was, a, she was very corrupt. She was black and she was extraordinarily corrupt. And um, she accused me of encouraging slavery when I was working in the wow. Mayor's Youth Academy and working with the, the black youth. Wow. You know, and she ended up being forced to resign because of the, of, of the things that she had done in her tenure. And she was given a $60,000 severance. So, you know, the, the, it's not clean on either side here. <laughs> And I think that was what really shocked me because I was very naive about it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, you know, the, the, all the, the black, you know, the brothers and sisters, they're pulling each other up by their bootstraps and they're helping the, each other out. And I was, I was really wrong about that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you remember Duran, cause she, she didn't like you that? either. No, she didn't like me at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I will. I will we say this. I, I will say this. Uh, Dwight Jones didn't like me either, so it was like it was a trickle down yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah, I was getting shit from the top so, you know, down to the bottom. And and there's, but it's not everybody. It's just like it's it's just like it's not like all white people are bad and all black people are bad. There just happens to be some really rotten white people and some really rotten black people and some really rotten yellow people and some really rotten brown people right right <laughs> so right. right yeah this is the truth you know and so and that's why i say i think it was um anya you asked about the you know educating people i just i think really to you you need to put the energy into people that can be aligned with you rather than the people that the way I said it after I left Richmond is that I want to work with people because uh, so many people are like, Oh, you need to stay. Richmond needs you. And I'm like, why would I want to stay somewhere where, where, where people say they need me. I want to be somewhere where people want me. Mm -hmm. I want to be wanted, not needed. Mm -hmm. Needed is codependent relationship. Mm -hmm. Wanted is an inter, um, uh, interrelated. What's the word I'm looking for? Sorry, I'm losing some words here. Interdependent. To be wanted. You're mm -hmm. looking for interdependent relationships mm -hmm. that we have to be building going forward. Mm -hmm. So, so find the people that you don't need to spend very much time explaining yourself to. <laughs> That's a class. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. That's yes. Okay. Amen. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you so much for this, um, Lisa. I appreciate you sharing some time with, with me and my friends uh, this evening. Um, you know, you've always been a major inspiration to me. Thank you for being real, and thank you for putting your heart on your sleeve and doing this work, because it's I know it's hard, and um, I know that. Even if, you know, I'm going to tell you guys, I would just want to tell you one more brief story to, sh to tell you how different it is for me up here. Do you, do you know who Paul Stamets is? Yeah. Any of you? Okay. So Paul Stamets is probably the most renowned mycologist in the United States. And it's worth looking into him. He's a, he's a brilliant, brilliant human being. He's really funny. And he's really into psilocybin. Mm-hmm. And um, the other day, I'm, I'm out working, and, and Bob Thurman, Robert Thurman is here, and he stops me, and he's like, hey, Lisa, do you watch television? And I was like, <laughs> he's like, you probably don't have a TV, do you? I'm like, well, you know, I've got, a, you know, an Apple TV. He's like, well, you need to watch Star Trek Discovery. You will love it. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm thinking, why is, why did Robert Thurman 
who, you know, was one step away from his holiness, the Dalai Lama, just tell me that I should be watching Star Trek Discovery. Oh yeah, my silly I'm running. <clears throat> so, so I'm like, okay, well, if he told me I should watch Star Trek, Star Trek Discovery, then I should watch Star Trek Discovery. So I go home and I figure out it's on CBS. So I, I do, it's free for a month and I download the app and I start watching it. And I don't know if you guys have seen it, but one of the main characters, Dame, is Captain Stemmets. And one of the main threads going through Star Trek Discovery is this massive mycelium for cloud in the universe and it's <laughs> totally psychedelic <laughs> and all about this spiritual cosmic world out there that that they're you know these star trek people are flying through and i i'm i'm just like i'm dying laughing at <laughs> my my world up here that <laughs> so oh, it's shit. just like that's what I'm saying. Like I, when you when you find the people that you're aligned with and you don't have to explain yourself to, your heart. That's when your heart can grow. You know, and and you can really shine. And that's what you want to be able to do is find the people where your heart can be open and you can be as shiny as you can, and you don't have to worry about dimming your shine. And that is a lot of what I felt like I had to do in Richmond, is mm. I had to dim my shine. And sometimes my shine was probably really sharp mm. and really fucking obnoxious mm. and full of shards of anger. But mm. you know what? I'm going to own it. Right. And, and I, I, have no, I have no issue with my anger. I mm. harness it, I think, for a good thing. But find the people that you're aligned with. Don't waste your energy on trying to change people. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and watch Star Trek Discovery. Because it's <laughs> really psychedelic <laughs> <like> and trippy. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, look, man, I'm going a, I'm to a bid you good night. Um, you know, take some amazing pictures of that beautiful valley that you're staying in. And, um, you know, I can't thank you enough for sharing space with us tonight. Um, you know, is there a way that we can, like, uh, you know, if they, if folks are following, can they follow the travels of Lisa Toronto? When are you writing a book? Uh, do you have a book already that you wrote? No, I don't. But I, after the pandemic, I, I, I have a title for it. <clears throat> are you ready? What was that? It's called Pancakes for One. Because <laughs> I found that recipe the other day. I'm like, oh, I'm stuck in my cabin. I want pancakes. How do you make pancakes for one person? And I found a recipe. <laughs> pancakes for one. <laughs> Made me laugh. <laughs> that is, yeah. <laughs> That's funny as fuck. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I've, I've tried to do that. It's damn near impossible. <laughs> yeah. I think just, you know, just on Facebook and I, I, you know, I, I'm really kind of computer averse right now. And I really just like being out doing the work and, you know, I you should see me with a pickaxe. I'm pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, man, I, I I love you, Lisa. You you're always. This is always good to build with you and vibe with you. Thank you for sharing so much insight with my crew, uh, my fam. Um, you know, we're gonna catch up, and I'll talk to you a little later. And the rest of y'all, um, I'll see y'all next week if I don't see you before then. I hope y'all have a great night, and uh, you know, be safe out here. You know, take some time for yourself. You know, even if it's 15 minutes, just kind of like get yourself together. It's a lot going on and, you know, it's important to take care of you. So, um, yeah, y'all have a great night, man. Thanks so much. Lisa, see you later. Bye-bye. Woof, woof. <laughs> <laughs> Ciao, everybody. <laughs>